Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the evening town council scheduled meeting for our committee tonight. And also, we're having a special meeting. We have a couple of items to cover under the special meeting category, which we'll get to first. Uh, I'm pleased to uh, welcome Jennings Gray uh, here this evening. Uh, Jennings, as those of us here know, for the most part anyway, uh, is the economic developer for Electric Cities, or one of the economic developers for Electric Cities. And he's helped us in years past when we've had store vacancies and so forth to help us try to find some retail for our downtown. And uh, due to so much interest within the community, uh, ongoing, I might add, uh, relative to the fact that we don't have a second grocery store option <coughs> in Edenton as of yet. Um, we invited Jenny to come in and speak to that point because he's been working behind the scenes for us uh, in that category as well. So I'm sure uh, our viewers at home will be very interested in hearing what you have to say, Jenny, then welcome back. Good to have you. Thank you, Mayor. Council folks, I really appreciate the opportunity to come to Edenton any time. Uh, uh, have a first place in my heart for Edenton, and, uh, and not only a beautiful place, but uh, a place that uh, uh, goes back quite a number of years for me personally. Um, uh, Edenton is a very unique market uh, uh, for any type of retail. Uh, incomes are high, population is somewhat low. Um, with the next the traditional sense, um, when we talk about population for city limit population. Um, with a low population, high income, uh, it would seem to be that the income would over, outweigh the low population. However, uh, with retail and commercial development, you have a uh, internal co competitive nature of the business. Uh, whereas traditional industrial development is somewhat external. You have one city buying against the other, or one state uh, competing against another state. With retail and commercial development, you are uh, competing internally and you may never know. It um, starts as um, uh, back when the big stores, big boxes were, were growing. Uh, Lowe's, for example, or uh, other hardwares or, or big box retailers, they may be growing at 150 stores a year, and every store would look at probably four or five sites per store location. When it went to the real estate committee, you may have a location in Alabama competing uh, for a location in, in Kansas uh, for the uh, 1200th store location, for example. Those two cities may never know they're competing against each other. At the end of the day, it comes down to risk for the, for the retailer. Where can I locate, uh, make the most money at, at the least amount of risk? And that risk is determined really by your area that you're locating in. If I have enough income and enough population in a small circle, that's where I want to be. There's less risk in that small circle for me to locate and have my business uh, be successful there. In Edenton's case, you have um, a a large circle of your retail trade area. You have basically a 15 to a 20 minute drive time trade area around Edenton that comes in now and supporting your local retailers. Um, and I would imagine that if you talk to retailers here in, in, the, in the community, they would, they would uh, uh, verify that's true. What, what that becomes, a, becomes an issue is and it's like, well, that's proven. It's a proven market. It is a proven market. And that's our, that's our message going out to these retailers. That Edenton on the surface looks like it's a small market. But when you get out to a 15, 20 minute drive time, that's where the market is. And, um, it, and it, it's convincing retailers that serving a dispersed population is just as effective as, this, as, this, as serving a concentrated population. And in so doing, um, uh, then you, once you establish that, then you go after the groceries that, and the retailers that are expanding. Uh, with, with the competition now in grocery stores in North Carolina that you 
certainly have read about and, and seen on TV. Uh, there's a grocery store war that's going on in North Carolina. And it really becomes, uh, they, they're targeting the Raleigh and the Charlotte metro areas because of the um, amazingly fast-paced growth in population and incomes. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the population in, in the Raleigh MSA market, they were, they're growing like 78 people per day. And that includes births, deaths, uh, relocation. And that's just an astounding number when you think about it. Uh, I think uh, somebody said that there was a new, uh, uh, one source was put it by saying that there's a new pot, new kindergarten class going every week in that area, which is incredible if you think about it in those terms. So, um, uh, and obviously, uh, there was a new Harris tier that opened up not too long ago in Briar Creek, just to share with you some of their numbers. Within a 15-minute uh, drive time of, of Briar Creek, there's 253,000 people. <laughs> In a 15-minute uh, uh, drive time of Edenton, there's 9,905 people. <laughs> but um, uh, so if you, if you look at, at, at that, and also on, on the leakage side of it, within a five-minute drive time of Briar Creek, there's a $60 million demand for groceries. Uh, currently, there's only 13 million in sales with that five-minute drive time of uh, Briar Creek. So they have a they have a huge demand for more groceries uh, sales in that five-minute drive time of, of Briar Creek. Eatons, on the other hand, um, uh, is just it, it's, it's, uh, it blows my mind. I was telling Emory earlier, uh, in within a five, ten, and fifteen-minute drive time of Eatonton. Uh, your current sales for groceries ranges from 30.5 million to 35.6 million. The actual demand, which you're supposed to uh, uh, sell, ranges from 5.5 million to 15 million. So you're, in some cases, you're, you're six times the sales of what you would be in a five minute drive time. That, that proves to me, shows me that, that People are consistently coming in from that 15, 20 minute drive time into Edenton. Um, and, and, and I think that's why you have such a protected sales area that you have here uh, uh, that, but from your current retailers. They're capturing all those sales. And, uh, uh, and what, it's forcing, but what it's forcing you to do is for alternatives, you're going to have to go outside of that trade area in order to get uh, alternative type retailers. And that's where we create the leakage, of course. Um, so what I try and figure out now is what, what is that true demand here? What can we say is a true leakage? What else is going out? Yeah, we're getting a lot of surplus sales in uh, from outside the market, but what are we missing? I mean, could those uh, $30 million sales, could it be $50 million? Uh, could it be 55, 45? What is the true number of the sales potential here at Edenton? And that's where we need, that's what we're trying to find out. And uh, the, uh, the, we did the, um, the grocery feasibility study with Kevin Anderson, and uh, he, he basically identified some of the potential sales you know, for the Edenton area. Uh, those sales were targeted for uh, basically the largest user would be a neighborhood market center, uh, which is operated by, uh, which is a, a concept of Walmart. The neighborhood market center is kind of getting back to their basic store. It's not a super center, it's not the express store. It's a nice size grocery store with a nice facade on it that mainly concentrates on groceries. They're getting away from the other, other uh, uh, goods and services there that, that they were expanding into. Um, unfortunately, I think it's in large part due to their concentration on going after the online e-commerce sales. They pull back on their bricks and mortar expansions right now. There are very few opening. Um, I believe that had they been in a growth mode as far as bricks and mortar, this market would be a perfect fit for them. Now, I think they would be interested. Um, not to say that that will come later, uh, but currently that's just what the feedback we're getting from, from Walmart. 
uh, Piggly Wiggly, uh, uh, IGA grocery stores, uh, Save a Lot grocery stores, Farm Fresh, and possibly even Lowe's Food. <coughs> Lowe's Food is not expanding. Um, uh, Save a Lot, they have a corporate store model, then they have a uh, franchise franchisee uh, model. Uh, depending on, on well, we get into Save a Lot and the other IGA and most, and sometimes even the people who the stores. The way their model works is that um, they need a second generation building. Uh, in other words, a, uh, a former Winn Dixie, a former Kroger, a former Harris Teeter, a former Food Line uh, uh, concept building that's, that has a space that uh, has the depreciation on it, they can go in and make the numbers work. Um, if we had that space currently, I still frost feel strongly that we would have a second, get, uh, second grocery store in Eden, but we just don't have the product to be able to offer to uh, a, a, uh, an IGA or an independent style type of grocery. Um, so how do we fix that problem? There's, there's a couple of ways that I've talked to the team uh, uh, with Anne-Marie, uh, particularly about uh, of maybe looking at possibilities of Thinking outside the box here, I mean, uh, you know, potentially setting up uh, some type of um, uh, system or, or process or, or uh, policy that would help offsite some of the costs associated with building a building or possibly re re offering a relocation of no building, uh, purchase of, of one, or uh, uh, looking at an investor that would be willing to cut the building lease it back and make it attractive uh, somehow uh, with a partnership with the town and or county that would allow a uh, grocery to make it work financially for them. And then you're getting back into that situation where he's in a competition competitive situation as well. He wants to locate a store where it's going to make him money just as we all would if we were uh, operating his business. In addition to the grocery store we mentioned, there's there's new players that are actually coming on, on into the market now. You may have heard of the grocery store Lidl. I think the closest one is in Elizabeth City. Um, and there's several around Charlotte. And they, they kind of concentrate on these smaller tertiary markets. And uh, they're doing really well. Um, they are basically a direct competitor for Aldi. Their store layout, very similar to Aldi. Uh, maybe because they're new, looks a little nicer. Um, they have a bakery in the new Lidl, have an extended wine section, and they're really nice stores, very attractive stores, but very similar to an Aldi type grocery store. Um, with the Lidl's arrival, that's caused Aldi to kind of kick it in gear a little bit and, and get competitive and <coughs> come back and remodel their existing stores and maybe look at some new markets as well. Uh, we, we've, we've approached both of these um, uh, grocery stores and um, uh, on multiple occasions, and uh, what what they are what they're saying is they're going to establish a little city first, and then maybe look at the markets as the market develops and grows. They are very interested in Edenton's market and are hoping that they can serve Edenton out of their. Uh, uh, Elizabeth City's location. And I'm sure based on the criteria that they collect during the time there in Elizabeth City, we'll determine to see how much impact they're, or how much business they're actually drawing from the EDC market. Um, what I, my, my uh, counterback to them has been, well, one, uh, somebody if a competitor does here, Wayne in Edenton, that basically cut them off in, in Elizabeth City, which is which they, they acknowledge that, and so that may be something that we will look at further as we go along. Um, Publix in North Carolina now, Wegmans is coming. Um, those large box retailers, uh, grocers, are uh, concentrating down in the metropolitan areas. They will usually, this is not particular to their, their particular brand, their particular banner, but typically they will locate in units of five. Uh, around the city, you'll see that historically, where uh, because of distribution purposes, uh, this makes it easier and more efficient distribution of the products and services. So, 
uh, as they as they grow and expand. Uh, certainly, you can see them looking at tertiary markets such as Edenton at some point in the future. But I don't think we're there yet. Um, so, where are we meeting these folks? How are we gaining this knowledge? Is through basically trade shows that we attend, um, and, and and we attend a lot of trade shows. That's through <coughs> the International Council Shopping Centers. Uh, there's a new uh, trade show coming up. It's National Grocery Association that we're we're. Uh, going to attend. Um, there's a, a franchise expo that we attend. There's two of those um, that we'll be attending uh, this coming year. And uh, we, we, I, I take that uh, grocery store feasibility study with me everywhere I go, basically, and hand it out to everybody that I see. Uh, I've had Harris Tier to look at it, uh, which is now, of course, with Kroger. Um, th they have even though it's not on their radar at all now, but they looked at the grocery store feasibility to get their feedback. He was very impressed by the study. It's a quality study, so I think we've got the right guy doing our study for us. Uh, it's very detailed, and um, it, it, it paints a positive picture for for Edenton market. Um, it's just that uh, it comes up down to the ones that can build their own building, do their own development. They're not ready for our market yet. And the ones that are ready for our market, we don't have the available product to put them in at the current time. So we're, we're kind of at a standstill there. Um, other alternatives would be possibly uh, maybe a, a co-op type grocery store um, where basically the town, through a partnership of some sort, <coughs> would um, enter and basically create a co-op grocery store that's been done successfully across the state. Uh, and, I mean, you're, you're poised in the right location for that. A lot of farming communities around that would actually, I mean, can't get much fresher than East North Carolina as far as farming products. Uh, me, myself, personally, I've never gone through the process of establishing a cooperative, but uh, it's been done and there's a process that's established in order to do that. That, that could be something that could uh, um, be, be possibly done in the interim. Um, there's, there's different type of incentives that could possibly work. We, uh, we've seen where they've done an overlay district for a special taxing district, basically, that's tied to sales tax. Um, it would be something fair because it wouldn't necessarily target just your local town citizens um, as far as like a property tax. It'd be a sales tax, so the people that are driving in from 15, 20 minutes out would, would may pay an extra five, six cents uh, on their grocery receipt um, for a certain period of time where that money would then go back to help offset some of the development cost or uh, off-site infrastructure cost or basically how you wanted to set that up. Um, that's certainly a, an idea that could help lower the cost of that property, that development cost that could actually provide a um, uh, incentive for a uh, grocery anchor to come into that center. Uh, developers that I've talked to absolutely love Edenton. You know, they said, you know, uh, when, when the population boom down there, let me know, and I'll, I'll be, we'll be there. Uh, they, they, they come. They already come to Edenton, uh, and they love it here. Uh, but it's with their family and kids, and they enjoy the amenities of Edenton. Uh, but uh, which is great. I mean, I'm, I'm glad they know the area, they love it, but uh, it's just that now there's other markets that you're in competition with that are, are taking the new products, unfortunately. I'll stop for a second and ask any questions you may have. When you were talking about um, Piggly Wiggly, for example, yes, sir. looking for uh, uh, second generation or older, Building. Yes, um, are there investors that build a lease to grocers? Sure. Um, as opposed to having the community get involved in, in that sort of thing. Yes, sir. Um, if we could, if we could find that, that's, the problem there is, you know, new construction is expensive, and um, uh, it, there's. there's the way typically 
you would lease the building and, and you would have to fit it to the, to the tenant's uh, needs. Uh, the, maybe probably about 35, 40,000 square foot building. Typically uh, have ample parking, uh, enough space for a butcher shop, if you will, um, a lot of bulk in coolers. So there'd be a lot of upfits for a grocery store typically. Um, that would be very expensive. Um, which is, and, and grocery prices are, are, are there's a low uh, uh, markup on the groceries. So uh, you would, the numbers have to be really, really tight in order to make it work uh, financially. And if there's any type of risk at all on top of that, uh, it just, it's just going to be very hard to, uh, to make it work. And that's where a second generation space comes into play. Um, typically, these are less expensive. They need a, a modest amount of, of renovation to them. Uh, and they, quite frankly, have been sitting for a while. And, um, and they're willing to make a good deal on those, on those buildings. Um, and um, the, sometimes the community will, will partner with, with a developer or, or the uh, tenant to help offset some of his upfront charges, like a facade grant, if you will, or a special rate, left for rate, because of the uh, large energy user that they typically are, because of the coolers and freezers, and such as that. Well, I was thinking that, well, listening to your comments, that if they buy a second generation or older building, the upfits would still be the same, would it not? I mean, because they probably weren't a grocery store prior well, to Well, and that's what they would like. And that, that's their yeah. first choice, is, a, is an old uh, Wayne Dixie right. building, an old uh, Walmart yeah. or Express. You know, when the Walmart Express uh, came on market too long ago, I mean, it, that's why you know, uh, Dollar General just grabbed them uh, because uh, it was just a perfect fit for them in these markets. It's frustrating, particularly after your opening comments about how the sales volume that exists in this town already is six times what it should be for a community outside. It just yeah. seems like there's some math in there somewhere that would work for a developer or 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 I, I agree 100%. Um, it's, it's just, you know, if you can get, if you come to Edenton, you got to get, capture a piece of that 30 million sales, or if it's 45 or 50, whatever that true number is, um, in a circle this big, and or I can go to somewhere else and I can get that same number in a circle this big. Okay. And there's just less risk in the smaller circle you're operating in more control you have over and less threats of someone coming in and sharing your piece of pie, so, so to speak. And uh, um, I think that's certainly why um, uh, your current grocer is so protective of the other space over there because he's trying to protect that circle of sales in his trade area. And that's understandable. And that's not uncommon. I mean, that's very common. Very common. That 30, I think 35 million that you were talking about, is that that's the annual on food and sale? Yes, sir. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. That's right. Yeah. That's your current sales as of, uh, basically this information is from uh, ESRI and um, it's their, their market analysis. Uh, it's, it's, it's an estimate, of course, but uh, yes, uh, that's just on groceries. Just on groceries. That also allows them to charge a little more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, to add to what you were saying, Jennings, um, last Thursday and Friday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, whenever it was, the mayor and Anne Marie and I were at the lead meeting, and a friend of mine that used to be a town manager is now um, an assistant manager down in Concord. He was telling Anne Marie and I, he said, we turned down four and five hundred housing units all the time because number one we cannot we, we can't service them with schools with fire departments police the whole works he said we just can't do it now, i mean it, it, here's a town that's got 46 engineers on their payroll and they cannot figure a way so you, you know you're right there's a population growth growth mm -hmm. everywhere but eastern north carolina and and um uh, Unfortunately, that's going to hurt our grocery and, and retail. I mean, you, you nailed it. Well, I think uh, it may be where 
I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the cooperatives have been very successful, uh, and they some sprung up out of, out of necessity, and uh, some have, have, have been established based on uh, really uh, needing an organic source resource back in the 80s when organic wasn't cool, you know, uh, nobody thought about the organic groceries, uh, but uh, so uh, some of the locals wanted organic options as far as the groceries were concerned. Uh, I never knew I was raised on an organic garden, I never knew that. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, you know, they, they wanted that and saw the, the value in that, so uh, they, they, they started cooperative, and that may be the answer here uh, for the time being. Uh, good quality produce, uh, uh, get your get your needs, get everything you need. Uh, obviously, you need we need a building, we need a building to do that in, and uh, that may be our first step in looking at that option. Um, Mallory has been with us just a, a few months, but he's already um, trying to generate some interest through some contacts he has with Kroger. Um, so that's another option. But as we've learned, as Jennings and his colleagues have, have told us and schooled us and taught us, it's a lot of it not only has to do with population, but also with the supply chain. And when you said, you know, the stores look to cluster um, around, you know, four or five, and we've learned that, um, you know, where are the distribution centers located? And that in order to attract somebody to invest in Edenton, you know, their distribution center, ha it has to make sense from that standpoint also. And something that's playing in our favor is the grocery war is fierce on the Outer Banks and also up in the um, Chesapeake area. And we've been told, and Jennings has shared with us that, um, and actually a developer working on a project at the Outer Banks that once they get their stores up and running, operationally things are sound, about six months later they start looking for, well, where, where can we go within 50 or 60 miles? So we're, you know, consciously optimistic that we'll get some looks at that time because of what's going on at the Outer Banks and in Chesapeake. Um, tomorrow morning, um, Jennings is going to spend the night and join us tomorrow. Mallory and um, Kevin Howard, our county manager, and I are meeting with representatives from the Edenton Village Shopping Center. They're coming to talk to us, and we have a lot of questions um, for them. And um, Jennings is going to stay and offer some um, insights in terms of some opportunities. You know, Food Lion has that space wrapped up. They have a, uh, they're in their second year of a five-year lease and they have three more five-year options so they can keep that property wrapped up and when you look at the numbers that Jennings is talking about the sales it you know $125,000 a year to pay for that store to stay dark is nothing um, you know they are they are not going to give that up they're just make smart it. Yeah. They are smart business people. But there is other space out there. There's other retailers that are looking for second generation. And we want to really press them to um, get going and do something, not just sit back and collect the money and say, woe is me. Um, so those things we're working on. And we're interested in the co-op. We'll study that option. You know, we'll look at it. Jennings gave us some communities to check out that have done it. And then we're also going to um, talk about an investor. You know, if there is interest from that second generation store market and we can't get them into the old food line, maybe there are some people within the community that would be willing to come together and build a low cost um, store where we could attract somebody like Piggly Wiggly or the IGA or even get Lowe's to, to look at it. So. We have work to do. Um, I really appreciate the assistance that Electric Cities is giving us. They're, they're part of the, the, the team. They're working hard on our behalf. I know it's frustrating. I know you get asked all the time, why don't we have another grocery store? Um, I think the team is committed. I know we're committed to getting a grocery store, and we really believe that we will. Um, Edenton is not a one grocery store town. 
um, but it's just it's got to make sense for the grocery store to, and we're going to do everything we can to make that happen sooner rather than later that's right. That's right. Yeah, so we have our commitment and uh, uh, it will happen I think it, it definitely will happen uh, it's just that Right now, the, the, the big boys are playing the big leagues, and I think once that gets saturated, and as Anne Marie uh, rightfully said, I think it's just a matter of time, time before it actually comes out and uh, comes back in that, and she's spot on with the 50 mile uh, radius. Uh, it, it's, it's definitely eating to set in a sweet spot within that within that range, absolutely. And the incomes are here. That's one thing you have in your favor. The incomes are here. Uh, and, and that, that certainly, and you have history here. Uh, I mean, you're, you're selling five times what you normally should be selling in groceries uh, within a five mile radius of town. Uh, you know, I tell my communities all the time that whenever somebody asks you what's the population of Edenton, you give them two numbers. You clarify exactly what they're asking for. Are you asking for the town limit population is this? But our trade area population is this number, and um, and that that's a it's a huge huge difference there. But uh, you know, retail, commercial development, uh, sales, they don't know any boundaries. There's no uh, uh, lines there where you cross in one town to the other. Um, if you need it, you go buy it, and, um, and if it's within a d decent driving or distance, that's what you do. Uh, grew up in a very rural area. And, you know, to go uh, any type of retail center was at least 35, 45 minutes away. And uh, we just would stick think about it. We just went. And uh, you didn't go every, every day, but uh, when, you, when you did, we just didn't think about it. That was the only option we had. And the same thing holds true here. I mean, 20 minutes, it's not, not a big deal. You can't get halfway across Raleigh some days in 20 minutes. You know, and a lot of commutes times are from home, work to home in Raleigh is, 35 minutes, so um, 20 minutes is really not that not that big of a, 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 a deal. Challenge. Do, do you think, in, in your professional opinion, that as far as corporate looking at us, looking at this, <coughs> excuse me, this 9,000 uh, population, um, do they look more at the the money, or do they possibly look at the declining population that we have? All over Northeast North Carolina, I mean, we're not the, we're not the only ones. Everyone else is losing population. Um, which which would they look at more? Well, it, it, well, it kind of there's other uh, indicators um, that you look at along with that, Steve. Uh, you look at you know what your hotels are doing. Are, are, what's the vacancy right there? You know, what's your um, uh, what's your tourism like? What's your downtown's like? Uh, you know, even Eaton's doing everything right. As far as their downtown is concerned, um, they're uh, they're marketing themselves very well. Uh, they're they're out and about. Uh, they have a, a pro growth attitude here, um, and um, it, it in the end, like I said, the incomes are here, and it's 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 a destination place that um, you know uh, that's very attractive, and it's poised in a location as as Emory said along the coast where. The coast is growing, uh, and there's a lot of interest in retail development on the, on the coast right now. And uh, like I said, I think Edenton's right was in the right, right spot. The incomes, I think, are certainly that it gets their attention. I mean, there's a lot of small towns in the East North Carolina with the same number of populations, but the incomes are just not there, and the growth potential is just not there. So, uh, the the historic beauty and, and uh, uh, of Edenton. I think uh, shines above a lot of the, a lot of the other alternatives locations in North Carolina. Could you possibly repeat that? It's nice to hear someone from uh, a professional perspective, um, you know, give credit to what the community is trying to do and has been doing. And, um, we feel that way, but. It, you get some affirmation or reaffirmation from uh, professional trades analysis and so forth, like you're providing is is uh, well, I'm always good. You, I, I, I feel like the, the secret of the sauce is, and uh, this is just my personal opinion based on years of observation. 
um, is consistency. Um, uh, when, when you have uh, leadership that's consistent, stable, uh, it makes all the difference in the world. And uh, I've seen that from uh, far western cities, North Carolina towns, the counties, to all the way to the other end of, of North Carolina, the eastern parts. And um, it's just, it's consistent leadership uh, with a direction that's open and, and uh, uh, that you can certainly, within five minutes of talking to the leadership, you know exactly what Edenton's about and uh, where it's going, where it's been, and the direction. And it's not, it's not just the individual's vision, it's, it's the town's vision. It's consistent. Well, Jennings, I, for one, am very grateful and appreciative for you coming and, and giving us these facts and figures uh, because we are getting killed by the general public, if you will, for the, not thinking that we're doing anything to try to attack, attract a new grocery store either. Um, I, I think there are actually some that, that think you can force a grocery store to come here, and we have certainly been very open with that and trying to uh, educate the general public as to what we are trying to do and trying to get more grocery stores here. So now if they will just watch this program and, <coughs> and, and know that uh, what the facts are and that we are actively <coughs> trying to get a new a different grocery store here. Absolutely. So thank you very much yes, for, my pleasure. for your time. My pleasure. Anyone else? Thank you very much. You. Very informative and timely. All right. Next item on our special meeting agenda is the Old Hertford Road Stormwater Engineering Analysis. Sam Rick, you would guide us through that, please. I will, Mayor. Um, in your packet, we um, <coughs> explained, um, first of all, that we received a grant, and you approved that grant last month from CAMA to um, pay for an engineering study that's needed to evaluate the drainage system from Peanut Drive <coughs> beyond the railroad tracks um, that flows um, behind Jimbo Jumbo's, behind Olam, um, Jay Lee, and then actually goes across uh, North Broad Street and into, um, we call, it's a tributary of Queen Anne Creek and goes under Old Hartford Road. And we all know that during Hurricane Matthew, that um, road was severely damaged. The culverts, um, I'm trying to get my IT up here, the um, twin culverts were damaged. Um, we were not able to convince FEMA to um, pay for upfitting the cost of the, the culverts. Um, but we know that we're, we're fairly confident that the culverts are going to have to be upsized. We're just not sure to what size um, because the railroad made a big improvement on their culvert. Get oriented. Um, this is. Right here is where the railroad made a big improvement. So all this area drains under the railroad into a much larger culvert now, and that water can get to our um, old Hertford Road culvert a lot quicker. So we need to we need to make sure that our culverts are sized properly, and also the culverts across North Broad Street. And DOT has talked to us about. Um, But using the results of our study um, to help up, upsize their culverts if that's what the study determines. And then there's also been a big question raised about the um, actual drainage ditch. It was pointed out, I'm sorry, I can't use the pointer tonight, that, here we go, um, in the area behind Jay Leak, there's um, some overgrowth and brush in there that possibly needs to be cleaned out and there's a question about is that um, the property owner's responsibility or DOT's responsibility 
So we're going to try and get those answers. So all of that means um, that we had to get an engineering study done. And in your packet, you received a copy of the proposal that was submitted back in April. And that proposal was used to help develop the grant application. The, um, the, the engineer is um, Stocks Engineering. And the reason we reached out to them they did all of the stormwater analysis for Jimbo's Jumbo's when they did their big expansion. They helped regulator after regulator flooded, and they actually worked with me and didn't charge the town anything to help get the railroad to go in there and, and make the improvements. So um, I, I told Stocks that their proposal was um, higher than the amount of money we had in the grant, and so they revised it. Um, Instead of them actually sending out a survey crew to do actual survey work, they're going to rely on um, existing maps to do the work. And I recommend that you authorize us tonight to um, proceed with hiring um, stocks. I know you hear it from residents along Old Hertford Road. When are you going to fix that road? And so the sooner we can get this engineering agreement approved, the sooner they can get started. And that's why I have it on the special meeting tonight, hoping that you'll take action. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Um, are the numbers, what is the, the cost? Is, is it these four numbers here, the survey, and the stream profile, and the um, drop? Sorry, one more. On, on. Thank you. This will be for the next item. They, um, the they eliminated the, I think it was like $4,600 for the survey. Uh, the yes. Yeah, that's 4675 And then they reduced the um, streamline narrative work by $600. So they're right in there with the grant. It'll be about $18,800. All right, council members, anybody <coughs> want to bring forward a motion that we proceed with this contract so we can start the evaluation to clear so moved. Second. Second. All right, thank you. Any further discussion? I don't see that we have a choice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, we don't. All right. We don't yeah. get old Herper Road fixed. Folks going to be in here beating up on us. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm too old to take a look at me too. <laughs> Okay, here no discussion. Uh, all in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Opposed no. Alright, proceed with that one, please, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. And that completes our special meeting agenda. Moving now to our committee schedule to meet tonight. We'll begin with uh, administrative chair by Councilman Biggs, please. All right, Mayor, we have three items on the agenda tonight. The first one is that uh, somehow we overlooked reappointing some of the boards and commissions, uh, as Anne Marie has put in the packet that uh, uh, Tammy has prepared the detailed terms expiring. And, um, she is going to put an ad in the paper and also uh, try to get some more applications uh, so that we can interview some people. Maybe we could have a special meeting mid-October and go ahead and interview them and get the ones on. We've had uh, one that had resigned from the Recreation Advisory Board and one that um, has said that she did not want to be reappointed. So we know those two positions need to be filled. So, Ms. Simpson, if it's okay with you, Mm -hmm. We will send that same recommendation on to the full council. Yes. Thank you much. And our next item is history work repeating launch. And Anne Marie has got a presentation. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Thanks, Lynn. Thank you, Nancy. Um, we are so excited. Last week we officially launched, we held a launch um, event at the 1767 Courthouse and Nancy Nichols, our tourism director, has been instrumental in helping um, Edenton 
with um, its responsibilities and participation in this project. Do you recall that uh, we were approached by the town of Warrington and they also asked um, Halifax to join together and create a program um, called North Carolina History Worth Repeating and on your dais is um, the final product and it really is just, just beautiful. It's a pocket passport and we're um, going to be targeting and marketing um, the three communities together to encourage um, people to visit Edenton, Warrington, and Halifax. And they have the opportunity when they visit different businesses that agree to participate in the program to have this passport stamped. And after they accumulate um, so many stamps, they um, take a picture, email, register online, and once a month they'll be eligible to win um, a prize or something from um, the communities that are participating. But the website, I sent you the link over the weekend. I hope you had a chance to look at it. We think it is really well done. Um, we're excited to be a part of the program. We're going to really work hard to market. Um, I was going to try and go through a couple slides, but I'm a little bit technology. Um, <laughs> Here we go, let's go to Eatonton and you can see. Here we go. And, um, this is on, uh, this is its own website, but then we're linking it to visit Eatonton, we'll link it to the town. Um, Nancy, did you, did I miss anything? Did you want to add anything? No, no we have, um, here, here in town we have nine sites that they can visit. And this is the first year that we're doing this together, the three towns. So as it goes along, if we have others that want to be a part of it, then we'll be able to do that in the future. Thank you for your support for this project. And we're looking forward to um, good things and being able to measure um, the success to see whether or not we need to keep, keep it going. Like say one thing about it that, that makes it particularly important for us as a community. This is the first time that I'm really aware of, of course, what we're working on for the 350, but the first time when uh, three communities have gotten together to make, make a, um, a target out of themselves in the sense that these are three exceedingly important historic communities, Edenton, Halifax, and Warrington. And by doing this and making this based on history, I think it's targeting um, a potential or that person or people that we consider to be a very major target coming to Edenton. So I think it's, it's really great that uh, we're part of it, that it is a targeted marketing complex, and it, it's a, I think it's a, a very good thing and unusual to, uh, to occur. And it's sort of dovetailing with the 350 Halifax and such like, which will have a, a similar passport but this one is exactly um, targeted to three communities. That have a lot in common. Historically. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. we have tonight, we have uh, Elizabeth Bryant here tonight to talk to us about reducing the fees for uh, food truck zoning permit. So, Elizabeth. Uh, Thank you, Councilman Biggs. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm here to speak to you tonight about your mobile food vendor permitting process. Um, currently, we established a process uh, with two permits after you uh, 
amended your code of ordinances and your unified development ordinance that made mobile food vendors or food trucks permissible in Edenton, um, one of the requirements that was set in those amendments was that these mobile food vendors or food trucks register with the town. So we have a form that they fill out with all of their health safety information um, and it does have some of the proposed locations um, on that form and that's a $50 form. In addition to that, we've been requiring them to fill out a commercial zoning permit for each location that they potentially would like to um, serve food at. Each of those zoning permits is $50. So they're being hit with a fairly hefty fee and we just had the case this week where one um, that had been permitted to locate at one commercial site in Edenton for a special event was actually at another location. So what would happen is each time they may alter those sites that they are going to serve food, they would have to come in and fill out an additional uh, permit and be charged the $50. Um, the zoning side of permitting mobile food vendors should be pretty straightforward. We're basically just looking at whether they're locating in one of the districts that is allowed under the ordinance. Um, we're, we don't have to examine much more than that. The other form where they're registering as a business with the town takes care of have they got all of the things that the health department would require for food safety, do they have their fire safety equipment, um, anything that we would deem necessary for public safety. So what we're asking for you to allow us to do is um, to simplify the zoning permitting process, simplify that form, and reduce the fee um, for that review to something like $10, uh, being that it's a more simplified review. So that's it in a nutshell, and if you have questions, I'm happy to answer. Uh, so, uh, I mean, help me help myself, okay? okay. Um, I, I noticed that in, in the comments that were provided to us, you know, it's one of those things that you don't want to overcharge them, but, and, and you know, it was stated that the restaurants, you know, have a one-time deal, they have to come in and pay this money and they're done. The difference that I see, and, and here's where I need the help, is that the restaurants are paying county, the town tax, uh, they're employing a lot of people, um, and, and and I'm all for the food trucks, all for them. I mean, I voted up here, I'm for them, I'm still for them, love to see them. But why do we want to cut the price back to help them versus trying to help the restaurants that are already here? I suppose it's mainly because we are requiring that permit for each and every location. So that's probably the biggest push behind it is that it's $50 for the registration form you know, the, that we have that we require and then it would be $50 each zoning permit that we would review. So if they are going to apply to be at five different locations then that would be $50 per location. Um, and it felt oh, like it could be um, inhibitive for them to want to, to locate somewhere in Edenton. Okay, can we do them the same way that we do the restaurants? Can we just come up with a one fee that covers all of their zoning? Well, we, and I we have talked with Anne Marie some about that, is consolidating the two forms into one form rather than having these two permits that we're juggling. Um, and that's certainly possible. The question then is, do you want to keep the fee at one flat $50 fee, or would you rather adjust it with the idea that you're reviewing both the health and safety standards and the zoning on the, on the same form? A restaurant right now, um, if they were to come to the town and apply for it, location in an, in an existing building, it would just be one $50 zoning permit fee. Um, so that is what they would fill out. It would be a little different if they were building a new building, that kind of thing. Um, 
So the food truck, we could simplify it that way instead. There's a couple options. I, I would think, so, uh, I mean, I'm just throwing out comments here. I, I would think simplifying it as much as you possibly can and, you know, throwing a flat fee of $250 a year if they're paying, if the restaurants are paying 50, then, and but it gives the food trucks the opportunity to move from place to place to place. They can come and go as they please, you know, uh, when you got brick and mortar, you can't do that. You know, unfortunately, you can't be at the special event uh, unless you have a food truck. Right. Um, but you know, I, I would think charging you know 250 bucks a year and let them park where wherever the zoning allows them to park. You just want to make sure that there's a hook that if they change locations, that they have to come in and. We have to verify that where they're going to be located is allowed under the zoning ordinance. Yeah. So if they're not paying a fee, they, if they come in and pay a fee for a blanket zoning permit, then we, how, do, how do we know where they're moving? That's We're why I was asking, help me help myself here. There's one option. We, I think. I'm not sure if it's spelled out directly in the code of ordinances or the UDO, a certain number limit as far as how many locations they can have. But um, on the forms that we have now, we do have a note, I'm guessing it's based on the ordinance, that there's uh, up to 10 applications. So that I'm inferring that means 10 spots around town that they could apply for up to that. So um, if we were to consolidated on one form we would want to list as many spots as they can think of at that time or have permission because the owner has to sign as well signing off on giving them permission to locate there and then the question Anne Marie raises well if they only have five and then they want to come back and add a six are we going to capture a fee at that point if we have it on one form with one blanket fee example where somebody wanted to operate in a residential zone and that's how we caught it with the zoning permit that it wasn't allowed and um, we, we want to be fair we want to be um, we want to be encouraging, encouraging yes I really want us to be encouraging I do too but I, I, I mean you just hit it we want to be fair but what but again, what's fair to the people that are already here? That, that's something that, that's always bothering me. We, we, we do so much for new people coming in, and we want to. We want them come. But, you know, we've got the people who have been the mainstay here, whether it's, you know, restaurants downtown or restaurants on the bypass, that um, we're... We're, we're actually taking business away from them. Again, I, I, I like them coming in. I, I'd like to see half a dozen of them. Um, I, I just don't, I, I don't know that we give them a special break. I mean, that that's what we said. That's what we said we wanted. When we, when we put this together, and it's only been, what, two months ago, that we, no more than three that we put this together. And I understand what you're saying. I guess my thought was that when we're reviewing a zoning permit for a food, food truck, it is not nearly as comprehensive as a zoning permit for a standalone business. And that's why we were suggesting a, a different rate. Well, the, the initial charge is the same, is it not? I mean, you just said if I came in up in the restaurant eating this bar in an existing building, I'd have to pay $50 to get a permit. Yeah, right. Um, I understand what Steve is saying to a degree, but not all our restaurants are open when people are here. Um, so this, this gives a level of flexibility to both our travelers and our citizens to uh, be able to get a bike to eat, either at an event um, that a restaurant, as Steve mentioned, that they can't leave their premises unless they have a trailer or a truck or something themselves. 
Um, And we say the $50 gives them the uh, opportunity for five locations. $50 gives them the opportunity for ten, up to 10 locations. Well, so the $50. Two $50 permits. Yes. So the, it's no, more, I'm, more like $100 that they're paying right now. Does that have a gift, please? They are applying for two, at, at minimum, two $50 permits right now. One form where they're allowed, where they're registering their business, allows them to list up to ten locations. But then they would have to have a separate zoning permit for each of those locations. Is how it is now. I got a question. Um, Sam, is it whoever gets there first? <laughs> as far as if multiple wanted to be. Yeah. If I if I register for all ten places, <laughs> do I get some geographical protection or? Well, your name is on the list first, and I guess it would be up to the property owner to determine um, if there's going to be a food truck war on their property. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that would be some to have food network here. Yeah. <laughs> I just don't feel comfortable sending it off. I mean, I, I just don't because, again, people here that have spent a ton of money putting together brick and mortar and have to do a lot more than the people in the food truck. I'm just trying to be fair to this. And, and I totally understand that it costs a lot to put one of these trailers together. It's, it's not something inexpensive. But I'd kind of like to see I'd like for us to leave it like it is at least for a year and just see where it goes from there. If you get a lot of complaints and want to come back to us before then, fine. But, um, and, and of course, I'm not the only one on this committee by any means, but uh, I, I'd, I'd certainly like to see us just leave it like it is for a year and, and see if we do get complaints. And uh, I mean, that there's, there's been a, like, again, I won't beat that, uh, there's been a lot of money spent in this town for restaurants, but more than just something with wheels on it that can move from place to place. And a lot more employees, uh, a lot more sales tax, uh, and, and I, I do want to make it easy on them, and, and I think at $50 a pop, that's, I mean, that's just the cost of doing business. But again, Ms. Simpson, I'll leave it up to you too. Is uh, what you agree with what you're saying? Okay. Well, that does it for our committee tonight, Mayor. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Next, we have um, finance. Anne Marie, would you cover those amendments, or if you would like Jennifer to, since Sam is absent? Sure. Um, we got other committee members in Councilman Biggs and Councilman Quinn. Okay. Y'all want to carry that budget? Yeah, I don't have what the budget amendments are. We, uh, Jennifer prepared. Go ahead. Go ahead. Amendments, two amendments. Um, one is pertaining to the airport fund, and that has to do with adding the revenue to be received from the Department of um, Division of Aviation for the fuel farm <coughs> system grant. And then the second um, amendment is adding the revenue from the grant that you received to do the 2017 Housing Finance Agency <coughs> Rehabilitation Grant Program. both related to grants and it adds revenue that we'll receive from the state and then it adds the expense where we will spend the money on the projects. I, I reviewed it and I'm, I'm all in favor of sending it on if, if yeah. you are counseling. Yeah, I mean it. it's, you know, it's all for the airport and you need to, the, the big amount is and we need to <coughs> move it on and make that happen. So that we can always say we have fuel for sale. There we go. All right. Um, 
next committee heard from tonight, or meeting rather, would be Public Works Committee, and that's chaired by Councilman Stallion, please. Thank you, Mayor. We have two items on our agenda tonight, and the first one is the uh, street overload bidding update. And we have advertised for bids for the overlay on Twitty Avenue and Luke Street and West Hicks Street. And only one bidder assessed the bid document. Uh, so we have to re-advertise the project. Uh, and Ms. Knighton has said she will update us on that. And, I will just, I wanted, I was really concerned that we only had one bid interested because this is a big project. And I spoke to the um, one bidder and then also um, after I got that report, talked to our consulting engineers with the Wu Company, and they confirmed. Um, you may be aware, but evidently NCDOT had um, been banking a lot, a lot of money in Raleigh, um, and the General Assembly told them that they had to spend that money down. They had about two billion dollars in the bank. Um, and, DO, and, the, and, the, and the General Assembly said, we're not going to give you any more money until you spend what you have. And so the last, I'm not sure how long this has been going on. It sounded like it was relatively um, recently, maybe the last six or eight months. But DOT has been issuing bids um, on the, um, every other Thursday. And they normally, during paving season, bid about a hundred million dollars worth of work every other Thursday. Now, for the last few months, they've been bidding up to four hundred million dollars worth of work. And it makes sense. If you've traveled to Raleigh, you see there's paving work going on all over the place. And so, because of the amount of work that has taken place, there's not the interest in a smaller project like ours. However, um, the engineers have said that the parameters for our project they think are attractive because their rules are different than DOT regarding temperature and also regarding um, one other component that I can't remember. So their thought is that if we bid it again, um, they're going to reach out again to contractors. They ask contractors to please bid. Um, but because it will be a little bit later and DOT season will be winding down, there may be interest the second time around. Tammy was successful in getting the bid ad published. Um, it will be published in the newspaper this coming Wednesday, and we've set a bid opening for October 12th. Um, hopefully, um, we'll get several bids, but we know that one bidder is interested. And then, um, depending on what that price is, we'll ask you, hopefully, for a special meeting that third week in October so that we can get the project um, awarded and started. Well, we need to send that on to full council? Or? Actually, not really, because we already advertised the okay. bid. So okay. All right. Thank you, Marie. And the next item on our agenda. <coughs> Agenda is the uh, farmers market. Representative Steinberg has uh, helped to help the farmers market secure a downtown redevelopment grant, and that grant was uh, like fifteen thousand dollars, and that was allocated to install a sidewalk on the south side of East Gale Street. The funds went directly to the farmers market, and the terms of the grant agreement called for the farmers market to expend the funds, which as we can all see, they are doing as we as we speak. Uh, this is a great project, and it's, it's at the old Etna station. I'm sure all of you have seen that. Uh, so do we need to take any action on that tonight, Anne-Marie, or send that to the council? Or? If you would, I think what we want is to enter into an agreement with the farmer's market that they will procure the sidewalk um, with assistance and guidance from Public Works and then once and they'll pay for the work but it will be done according to our standards and once the sidewalk is installed um, the town will accept responsibility for future maintenance of the sidewalk. I noticed, noticed they have torn up that sidewalk all the way out to the street. Are they going to pave the whole area right on up to the street? 
Are you talking about on the farmers market? Yes. Uh -huh. They, I don't think they're going to pave the whole thing. They want to leave some green space and things like that, and they're closing up one of the. They're actually closing up one of the driveways, yeah. Yeah. Um, and they're going to leave that um, for green and trees. Actually, they talked to us about trying to plant some trees. But there's not a sidewalk on the south side, so when we have visitors that are walking from the post office to the um, state historic site, they have to get into the street to go down, you know, to the entrance where the visitor center is. So this will be a nice project, and the sidewalk will go um, as far as fifteen thousand dollars will carry. That's all we have, Mayor. Thank you, sir. Speaking of that, real quick. Does anyone look at that tree that's right in front of the farmer's market? I could be wrong. I, I mean, I walk by there at least four mornings a week, and, and I, I think that tree is about dead. We'll look at it. <laughs> it might be, might be a good time to take it down and yeah. plant something nice there. Half of it's dead in there. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we've completed our agenda here tonight, so uh, that being done. Thank you for your input and this meeting is adjourned.